Boom. <laughs> Dude, there's nothing cooler than practically shooting a tentacle. <laughs> I have a feeling 99% of everything we're seeing here is a lot simpler than people expect it to be. Oh. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> whoa, 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 wow. <laughs> that was perfect. That was perfect. That was, oh my God. Hello everyone, welcome back to Express Yourself. I'm your host, Brandio Daniel. We're gonna go talk to some people courtesy of today's sponsor, ExpressVPN. Let's see what they have to say. Hello everyone, how are you? Oh, hi. Hey, Nico, what if I was to tell you that surfing the internet without ExpressVPN is like being on a bus on the speakerphone with everyone being able to hear your phone call. I would cancel my internet if that was the situation. Okay, well that is the situation when you're surfing the internet without ExpressVPN. That's because your internet provider can basically see everything you're doing online. Sites you visit, time you spend on them, yeah, even the stuff you look at in incognito mode. What do you have to say about that? Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like drinking water straight from the tap. <laughs> Kind of. What if I told you that accessing the internet without ExpressVPN was like going to the bathroom in a public place with the door open? Oh, that's so embarrassing. I've only done it a few times. What if you turned on your television and there were no shows? Scary, I would be so scared if there's no TV back on. ExpressVPN allows you to access content that's not available in your country or region. What would you have to say to that? Am I going to jail? Absolutely not, it's a free and open internet. That's right, that's how we do things around here. Free and open. When you access the internet with ExpressVPN, not only are you able to access content that's not available in your country or region, like I do when I like to watch my sports, you can also get additional layers of security and encryption while your data is out on the open internet. So not only are you better protected, you also get access to the world of content that's out there and available for you. Go to expressvpn.com slash corridor crew and you can find out how you can get three months free. Let me spell that for you. E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash corridor crew. Man, not using that. <sighs> gonna look like a real chump, dude. Anyway, thanks for joining us here on Express Yourself and... Wait, whoa, whoa, I feel a tremor. Oh. Hey, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of Visual Effects Artist React. Dude, wake up. It's Saturday, open your mind. It's your weekend, come on, let's start having fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's cool? Just getting into it, let's go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Man. Oh. Tremors. tremors. Oh, oh tremors. yeah. Oh my God, this was the scariest movie when I was a kid. I remember watching this and I was blown away. And as I return to rewatch parts of this movie, I am just utterly convinced that it is a fantastic film. It's not just a genre piece. It's not like a horror thing or a sci-fi thing. It is a really well-made movie that's also really funny. Let's take a look. Ooh, Whoa. wow. Dude, look that at that. Sand. There's just like distant gunfire happening. And it's just like, huh? <laughs> What's going on in there? Classic other side of the <laughs> mountains. Meanwhile. <laughs> what, were those blanks? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dude, that shot. Oh, I my love God. That. We're back to the reveal of like, oh, yeah, they have a million guns. I love that gun wall reveal. Yeah, I know. It feels like a scene from like Naked Gun or something. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's very funny. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Dude, there's nothing cooler than practically shooting a tentacle. <laughs> you know, Especially like, if you just wrapped around your ankle. Happens in Return of the Jedi, happens in Lord of the Rings. They don't use a shotgun. <laughs> so the little mini tentacle guys, they're basically on rods and you can control the way they're like undulating via like twisting and turning it and huh. puppeting it behind that. So obviously each time they're connecting to someone's foot, they are reversing it because they're not dexterous enough to like wrap around someone, but they are dexterous enough where if you do have it wrapped around someone, you can unwind it in a smooth fashion there, as you can see. Yeah, it looks like what they did there is they just did it backwards. You're probably Yeah, right. it hits his other leg. Yeah, as it unwinds. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, oh, is that, that blue was that a comp? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. a little VFX happening. I think you can count on one or two hands the amount of like optical composites in this movie, and this is <laughs> one of them. I was about to say, this is an old school optical composite. You can see like the gamma shift on the background. There's a clear white edge around him, so like the mat isn't perfect. Is that a miniature or full scale? I wonder. I'm starting to think it's a miniature because they're not showing the actors at the same time. But and the one time like... they did, he was a blue screen element. 
So, uh, actually, the crazy thing, it's actually a mixture of both miniature and full size. That's awesome. And if you go to that very, very first shot when it busts through. I was going to say, it was like she's partially obscuring it without any evidence of blue screen. Right there. Oh, yeah. That's one of the few full size shots in the scene. They have it on rails and they're just zooming it into the set wall. Wow. You pointed out, like, you saw that one shot that was composited. To have these people shooting giant blanks in that direction, I just don't think that would be safe. Yeah. <laughs> so that's when they set up a miniature set and blast this thing with squibs and smoke. And the only way to get that shot safely was to composite the guy on top of the miniature plate. Not to mention, when the monster is flailing around and smashing through the ceiling, getting a full-size animatronic to move that way is nearly impossible. <laughs> oh yeah, explosive flare. This has to be one of the shots where they use the full size worm because if you were to try and do this in a miniature fashion, it would be really hard to get it to look right. Like imagine if this was like half the size, that flare would look comedic basically yeah, yeah. with the like the size of the sparks and all that stuff. Not to mention like each time you see dust float around in the room, it's like it's at the right scale because it's, it's it is. All that stuff where you're seeing it burrowing, it's actually just like a giant ball that they have underground. And they have like a whole trench built basically. And then they're yanking this ball with a cable that's just going through the earth and breaking really? all of the, oh, of the stuff cool. they've laid down on top of it. It's definitely like the ultimate practical effects movie. More often than not, it's just experimenting and coming up with a good idea gives you an effect that's just as good as, if not better than anything that's like super expensive. It's like, oh, what if we just put a ball on a chain and hooked it up to like, you know, Joe's four by four and just dragged it through the ground. It's like, oh, that looks just like a worm going through the ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, heck yeah. He's a big slug, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Oh, there's so much liquid in that thing. They just pumped it full of Gatorade and just let it drop. <laughs> that's so awesome. You see how it's all scored and sliced up so the, all the goo comes out? Yeah, you're right. So that shot of it landing is also still then a miniature, right? It yeah. looks large scale, and like you were saying, that means they have to film that in slow-mo. You can kind of tell it's filmed in slow-mo. You can kind of see it has a little bit of that slow-mo feel. Like, I wonder what scale that is. The liquid is, is so like thick as, it, probably as it's moving. Big. That's probably like a six foot long worm, I'm guessing. Yeah, I was about to say, that's probably like a human sized one. Wait, that's a full size thing. Wait, go back, go back. Yeah, you, oh wait, no, that's comp Tim at the top there. Yeah, you can see the, the frame jitter from the film going through. It's just his element that's comped, right? Because I think the whole sky. But look at all the smoke and stuff that's going over it. Because there's oh. no mat lines on the dust or sand or stuff. I think they just have it masked so that where the rocks move, you notice how they don't go over any clouds? Yeah. Like it could just be masked. But also notice how the mat line by Kevin Bacon ends right where the dust is. See how there's like that kind of black edge of the mat line between oh, uh, the yeah. sky but and the wall? Honestly, just watching it in motion shows that it's composited. Well, I'm kind of curious about the last shot, too, because it looks the best. I'm curious how they would get the hole in the cliff. Oh, what if it's actually forced perspective? Oh, it could be. You're right. Oh, my it could be. God. Yeah, he could just be on, literally on the roof of, like, the studio building. He might just be on, like, some scaffolding, and they just... No, you're right. That looks like a forced perspective shot, because I don't see any comp work going on. I don't see the jitter. I don't see anything weird with his character. That's basically just the miniature cliff close to camera. And he's back there way up high. So I think one of the reasons why this movie is so great is because they storyboarded every single shot in the film. It was meticulously planned out. There's no coverage. It is pure intention. And I think when you put that much planning into a piece like this, it generally <laughs> turns out really well. There were more Tremors movies after that, right? There so were. I assume there are more Tremors VFX. Leave a comment down below suggesting which Tremors VFX from the sequels we should take a look at. So I'm going to show you guys some TikToks. Oh, no. What? From this one creator called Ilmaru. Friend, what do you notice that's odd about these TikToks? Well, uh, nothing jumps out to me yet. So is it weird that there's just no one in any of these shots ever? Yeah, so this is a TikTok channel dedicated to this person that's woken up in this world with no one in it. And it's just oh. an empty world. And he's like on a cruise ship and there's no one around, no one driving the boat, there's no one in these cities. Incredibly easy to do if you just time it to where there's no one around. <laughs> 
But it's hard to time some things to where there's no one Yeah, around. like especially in a city when there's always going to be someone walking around. What is going on? Are these photo scans? No. I don't think so. What is this? I think we're looking at a mix of just good timing, good editing, good camera work, and some painting out. There's actually some really handy AI tools that remove things from frames, but you'll also notice like there's choice cut points, you know? Yeah. And very choice things being revealed sometimes. It's like barely shows the feet. Very selective field of view here, right? They didn't show anybody to the left or to the right of that angle. Uh -huh. And it's off season, so there's not a lot of tourists there. If there's no one around, how did he get from America to Europe? <laughs> actually, it's part of the story. <laughs> Fair play, all right, you got me. I have a feeling 99% of everything we're seeing here is a lot simpler than people expect it to be. Yeah, well first off, most of his shots are at sunrise. And if you know anything about filmmaking, you know the fun story behind 28 Days Later, where they're like, wow, how did he get that crazy shot in London where he's walking around in downtown and it's empty? And well, it was really simple. And they just said, the way we did the shot is by waking up super early and filming it the moment there was enough light to get an exposure <laughs> and there was no one around. It's funny how these kind of look like nerfs and they kind of look like photo scans. Like, I, it's weird. Like, I can see why people are like, this is Unreal Engine 5. They're like, it's not Unreal Engine 5. Unreal Engine 5 doesn't look like this. And it's not nerfs and it's probably not photo scans. No. I don't see any of the classic artifacting that you'd get with a nerf. You get like these little floaters around the edges and this we're seeing extremely good detail off in the distance and the flare from the sun is the classic flare that you'd get in an iPhone lens. So that's also kind of betraying the sort of rendered look that you would get with a neural radiance field. And it's definitely not just a simple photo scan because then you have to render it out and that's just gonna make it look CG, which this does not look. Well, look, that's actually a really great shot. He says, I painted graffiti on the tower, meaning he's messing with visual effects, okay? Because there's, obviously he didn't put graffiti on the tower. He's doing motion tracking. And so just right there, that shot establishes the fact that all these shots that we're seeing can be manipulated yeah. with visual effects. And the simplest answer is that he's probably just doing occasional paint outs and motion tracking on these shots yeah. to remove movement and people from his shots. But this gets a lot more complicated when the camera is moving through 3D space like this. If the camera is just like static or just looking around but not moving, really easy just to track in a clean plate. But what gets me is that he's still moving the camera around, which doesn't make it impossible, it just ups the difficulty. Oh, they do do visual effects, okay. Oh yeah, he doesn't care at all. <laughs> I mean, that's actually a pretty sweet little uh, yeah, field there. Yeah, motion tracking spot on. Once again, they are very much demonstrating that they have the abilities yeah, to do this. Absolutely. Little things like this, I think, are like the few things that really establish like the artistry potential of social media. This kind of storytelling is like so unique and just works perfectly on a platform like this. Well done, Kilmaru. All right. Okay, everybody, listen. Done it listen. For years, dude. Listen. Open the analytics. Nick is telling me to do this. Look, we started this on YouTube, okay? So we're allowed to do it. Guess the percentage of subscribed viewers. 20. Nope. Percent. Nope. 10%. Nope. 5%. 48. 1%. No. 93%. No. No. Close. Wait, really? What? Yeah. 80% of you watching are subscribed. It's working? <laughs> it's finally wow. happened? So I'm not even gonna, I'm not gonna say anything anymore. Thank wow. you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thanks for subscribing. I know you love Darby O'Gilly. It's my favorite movie. VFX supervisor specifically referenced Darby O'Gilly talking about this movie. <laughs> no way. Yeah. <gasps> Giant. Oh, oh snap. My God. This movie? Wait. Indian in the cupboard. I loved this movie as a kid. Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wow. <laughs> that was Perfect! That was perfect. That was... Oh my god! There was parallax change with his body and everything! What an incredible shot. Grade A compositing. This is the kind of compositing that we're looking at in 1995, and we're still trying to get this good at compositing. Holy now. frick! <laughs> was this ILM? Yeah, this is ILM. Classic. Of course it's ILM. Of course. I mean, this is just crazy. This is just really, 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 really good compositing. Oh yeah, because I'm really confused how, where the composite starts in this shot. Because 
when he's walking in the cupboard, it looks so good. But having an upscaled set cupboard with that level of detail and having the fingers there, it starts to make no sense. Only the actor so, is composited. So yeah, I was about to say, I think I noticed, because I was looking at his shadow as he goes across the little threshold there, and it like folds down. So I think it's his real shadow that's being projected onto the blue screen, but it cuts off and it turns into a painted on shadow that folds across the threshold there. They actually have a giant blue screen hand that he steps onto also. Oh, wow. Wow, <laughs> really? Yeah. Because I wondered, I was like, like, he jumps on something, but then the camera moves as we follow him. So he's having to be motion tracked onto the real footage of the hand, but there's parallax with him. So whatever he's getting on has to be at least moving. Yeah, perspective does change. He could also just be rotating in place. That's good. So yeah. how I would do that shot is like the shot filming him is locked off. And as it gets on the thing, then that rotates slightly to time up yeah. with the parallax that you would get as uh, we follow the hand up to his face. Yep, and they have like the boy slightly holding his thumb up, so it covers the contact point on his hand. That's like a super pro tip. These are subtle tricks, right? Like the difference between this and this is having an effect that looks amazing and having an effect that looks like garbage. Yeah, yeah, it's literally that simple. Having this knowledge of like what works and what doesn't, and you alter the shot just a little bit, and suddenly it's way easier, it's way better versus being impossible and janky. And that's, I mean, that's a common complaint is having like directors or you know, cinematographers that don't understand visual effects, and they film stuff not for visual effects, and suddenly you have a shot that just doesn't sell as well, or it's really hard to do, and all you need to do is just move the camera two inches this way, and it's perfect. There's a certain magic surrounding the mid-90s movies that had ILM working on yeah. them because there weren't that many VFX shots, so that meant every single VFX shot was a hero shot. You want to see my favorite shot from the movie? Yeah. It's coming up right here. Okay. Oh, yeah. Whoa. I think this is the first Wait. case of a lightsaber actually illuminating the environment also. Wait, yeah. <laughs> it's like... A perfect lightsaber, like yeah, it it, it blurs out. It to blurs a, correctly, yeah. yeah. So you see this in all the Star Wars prequels. All they did with the lightsabers was like roto it, make it white, and then give it a glow. But in real life, when stuff's being motion blurred, the more it's moving, the more the exposure comes down. So a hot lightsaber, the base where it's not moving much in the frame will stay white, but the edge of the fan where it's moving really fast across the frame, you get a lot of motion blur, will come down in exposure. You actually see this in the, the most recent Star Wars films. They're finally starting to do that effect, the correct physically accurate effect. But this is 1995, and I think this is the first time you have that actually happening with the lightsaber. They have the correct motion blur exposure change where the top of the lightsaber is not white, but kind of like a, a, like a rich pinkish red, and it becomes white towards the hilt. And it's illuminating the world around Darth Vader and the T-Rex. You know why? I bet it's real. You're right, it's probably a practical... Uh, that whole set is probably a real set, because at least the top half of it, obviously the T-Rex is going to be CG here, but it's not that hard just to make a little platform and then the two walls that he's standing up against, and if they have an actual real tube filled with red light illuminating that part of the scene, you would get that exact effect. And the reason why we're praising how real it looks is probably because it is real. I feel like they probably just filmed a real glowing tube. And yeah. He's probably just holding a fluorescent light bulb. <laughs> probably, right? He's not hitting anything with it. He's not having a spar. He's just yeah. swinging it around. There's a Star Trek. I think there's a Klingon in the back in there too. Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah. There's like that that one guy with the weird big ears. The, the Ferengi. Forehead. Yeah, Ferengi. Just getting wrestled by the Klingon. It's not a Klingon. It's a. Oh wait. I forget the name of it, but it's not a Klingon. Oh okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to fully reveal how nerdy you are. I don't know. Okay, Jesus. It's like, it's like what, what's it like Star Trek races? What's the name of that guy? Cardassian. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> it's one of the Cardassians? <laughs> yeah, it's Kim Cardassian. <laughs> See? It's a Cardassian, these guys. Oh, oh my it's god, a Cardassian. you're right. You're right. Yeah. Killer. Whoa. Look at that shot. Whoa. Dude, that's a What a flawless shot. This is a perfect visual effect shot with zero technical flaws, and it sells itself. The whole shot is real in camera except for the dude. Yeah. The out of focus twigs being composited over him? Yeah. That's insanity. I don't see any other way around this other than like motion controlled cameras. It's, it has to be, right? This has to be just a big motion controlled rig. So they would have filmed the shot first 
with some sort of motion control rig where it's actually recording the motion as it goes around it. So now that they have the data for that, they can scale that up. These days we do it with just like a robot arm and go through the same camera motion. And there's a very clever move at the beginning here. So let's say, once again, you're filming your real actor on a blue screen in this case. Well, to do this motion control, you have to have the camera 50 feet back. Yeah. You know? yeah. At the beginning here, if that chest wasn't in the way, the camera would have to go like hundreds of feet back. So by revealing them halfway through the shot, yeah. they only have to pull the camera back as far away as we see from the actor here. And the other really interesting thing they discovered is, you know, they're doing motion control on the actor, and they're doing motion control in real life, and it's scaled. But when you then take the actor and you stick them to that part of the model, like, you know, you have the motion control, so it kind of sticks, but then when you have an artist go in and, like, pixel perfect stick them to things, it just totally fixes all the, like, the issues of them connecting. I saw a little bit of sliding. A little bit right there, Just too. a tiny little bit. He's got like this little cloth dangling behind him on whatever sort of rig he's sitting on, but that cloth kind of slides a little bit right here. Yeah, yeah, it's just very subtle. So subtle, like you can't even notice it. There's one other really challenging and clever thing happening here, as you guys pointed out, which is filming things in close-up when they're tiny, you get very shallow depth of field. You can see how like the sticks go out of focus really fast. And it's challenging because they can't get an aperture that wide to film the actor but they make up for it just by being very precise, keeping the focus locked on that point as the motion control happens. And then of course, rotoing out these out of focus objects in front of him, which I, I don't know how they did it. <laughs> I mean, just a feathered mask, you know? It's like, it just requires very specific fine tuning of making that feather big enough. So here's the problem with that though. If let's say you have something that's very out of focus and you're trying to like rotoscope that and put that in front of someone else, where do you put the line? Because if it's a wide line, well then suddenly now you're dealing with this bokeh that has elements of your background still mm -hmm. yep. within that. That's and the then challenge. if you make it too small, well then your nice bokeh is lost completely and it just tightens up. And even if you make it a happy medium, like, all right, a little bokeh and then a little tighten up, there's still that the remnants of the background within the bokeh. We can see yep, it here. We're totally it's seeing it. it. So watch it. You can, you can actually see the background come through that out of focus stick. Yeah, right there, just a little so bit. So when it's in front of him, it's a right, smaller right, stick. Right here. When it, yep, right, yep. yep. See when it passes in front of the stick behind it, you can see the stick behind it in the out of focus blurriness of the stick in front. Oh, also, uh, fun trivia. This movie was directed by Yoda. Nice. Mm -hmm. Sick. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? Yep. Frank Oz is the voice slash puppeteer of Yoda, and he directed this movie. Huh. Directing, I will. <laughs> Can't I say? <laughs> no, 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 no. So, Ambulance is a movie that Michael Bay directed. This came out last year, and the reason why I love this so much is that there's a lot of really incredible FPV drone footage in it from a company called Lightcraft. The main pilot on this is Alex Vanover. He's a super incredible pilot, and he had one shot to fly underneath a flying cop car that went off a ramp and he didn't know that there was going to be another cop car right behind it and he just barely missed it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think they replaced the bottom of the car and also they put CG rocks over the ramp. This movie wasn't that high budget, especially for a classic Michael Bay movie, but they did destroy a lot of cars. They had a, a real ambulance that they're driving around. These are real stunt cars and they're trying to get as much of this done practically. And yet there's this one shot on the highway that I was like, okay, those were not real. But so many people were like, but they had to be real. Everything else was real, right? <laughs> Oh, that's definitely CG. That's definitely CG. <laughs> this is definitely CG. The camera goes through it. I'm just confused why you would plan a shot like this and have the drone go through it. I feel like that's like an afterthought. It is a little weird having the drone go through the car. I mean, who knows what the decision-making process behind having the shot continue for a second. Maybe it was like we wanted the car crash to happen here, but we wanted the shot to end here. And you can't just like have the car crash happen and then just continue going down the road breaking physics. I'm almost certain that the thought process is, this looks cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's all you need to do. That's yeah. all you gotta do. It's a cool shot though. Absolutely. That's cool. I mean, there's a lot of cool shots in this movie. Hey, if you've been watching this show regularly on Saturdays, well, we have an extended version on our website, CorridorDigital.com. It's usually like a half an hour long and it helps support us to stay independent and make this content just for you. So check it out. Thank you so much for watching. We'll check back in next week to see if you're still here. Bye. <laughs> Yo, latest. <laughs>